one, since it is uh, a memory one, this can be healed. And the film is intended as uh, uh, such an agent of, let's say, a collective historical therapy. For this reason, the narrative device which is at work here is very different from what we saw in the previous films. It is not, let's say, the anonymous authorized narrator who works hard to update the correct relation, the correct telling of this contentious episode. It is uh, very clearly a dissident narrator who speaks up vehemently and it is a counter-memory which is set up. The angle of the depiction of the sequence is completely different for what inspires it. Is that justice, the idea that justice has not been done to the victim. It is that this abuse of power, the internment of the American Japanese after Bernardo, has been just written off from official history and from, let's say, let's say from school textbooks. The second distinctive, very distinctive feature of this film is the encounter in it of two collective memory sources, or the memory of two uh, groups, two communities, if you want, which have been treated like outcasts in contemporary American history, which have been defamed, harassed by the state. So on one hand, the Japanese Americans, as we saw, and what is new in this narrative, uh, on the second hand, the radical workers' movement. Jack, so you will see on the film, Jack, the main character, is uh, what he calls himself a sweet shop lawyer. He's from Irish origin. Sweet shop, uh, sweat shop lawyer, sweat shop, sorry, sweat shop lawyer. It means uh, a legal expert who has learned law on the job. That is, who never graduated from or at the university, at any university and a guy who struggles on two front lines. First, against the repression by the police or the workers' movements, or the workers' actions, like strikes, etc. And second, against the hegemony of the mafioso trade unions, which are, as you know, very, at that time, very powerful in the United States. And get of its at the time, that is at the time of the Great Depression very sharp, of course, very hard times for a guy like him, like Jack, who cannot, as you may see in the film, who cannot stand social injustice. And this commitment to the workers' cause is what makes him immediately sensitive to the wrong which has been done by the state to the Nisei and Issei after Bernhardt. He espouses their cause, especially, of course, since he has fallen in love with a young Japanese-American girl. So this is the paradigm of the Japanese uh, girlfriend, which uh, back, uh, backlashes here. And he marries this girl in spite of the strong opposition of her father. Then they have a child, a girl, and this girl appears in the film at different ages, and she is actually the implicit narrator of this, uh, all this uh, dramatic story. And this too makes the difference with the previous films. This issue, the presentation of crossbreeding uh, as some kind of as an issue and as some kind of an answer, answer to racist discrimination. That is, this young girl who is half half uh, is very cute. Uh, she is very American too. She prefers ice creams to tea, 
but she is Japanese too, she speaks Japanese, and maybe she can appear as a, a foreshadowing of what a post-racist, a post-right supremacist America could be, or would be, or should be. In this film, the feature of the detention camps, internment camps, where the American Japanese have been sent, this uh, depiction uh, contrasts very much with what we saw previously, uh, for example, in Eternity to Hell. In Parker's film, what the inmates have to bear in these camps is extremely trying. It's extremely humiliating. And humiliating enough uh, that some of the young internees uh, choose at the end to leave America or Japan and this on the occasion of an exchange of prisoners. The film also stresses, and this is a political issue of course, that the decree on the internment of the Nisei and the Issei has been directly signed by President Roosevelt himself, the, the providential man of the New Deal, the political hero of let's say, uh, American left, enlightened, American progressive America. All these details, but which are not exactly these details, underline or are intended to underline the dissenting character of this film as it invades the other dimension, the, the non-presentable dimension of the history of the United States during the Second World War. But, there is a bad but and a very big one. On the other hand, this dissident, this protest film, I mean protest film always from the angle of the repressed, suppressed issues, the film raises. This protest film, this dissident film, is as well, a perfect commercial product from one of the big majors, of one of the majors uh, in Hollywood, that is 20th Century Fox, big corporation. It is very clearly a soap opera, or let's say a middle drama, which does not, as you will see, does not refrain at all from making use of the most vulgar sentimental tricks. And this in order to mobilize the audience's emotions and to make it, the audience, the public, dissolve into tears. For this good reason, I imagine, it was nominated for the Pandador of Cana at the time of its release. So, Everything happens here in this film. And I think it's a very good lesson about what cinema can be or is an ideological apparatus or a political apparatus and an agent for or of collective memory. Um, everything happens as if this form of the film, I mean the melodrama in the worst of the word soul. I mean, this would be what had to be given in return for the rather, let's say, offensive character of its political content. And this sort of compromise between form, narrative form, genre of the film, and content, this sort of compromise is very typical for Hollywood. From the filmmaker's angle, it relies on, let's say, an opportunistic attitude, but as well on a political and pragmatic calculation. The, melodram the melodramatic form of the film, that is, 
dramatic love story, gripping sentimentality, all this is what makes the film fit for the general audience, for a popular public. So, it is supposed to be a condition, a condition for the political message of the film to be conveyed. This is the calculation of the author. In my opinion, it's a false, it's a false calculation. Uh, um, let's say the box office uh, of the film, in spite of all these concessions, uh, was quite poor. It was not a hit at all. Now, what we, I mean, we in general, not necessarily as a very sophisticated uh, public, but just as ordinary spectators. Uh, just spectators who, let's say, have their dignity, that is, who don't like to be treated like food, simply this. So what we, as best kind of spectator, can strongly object to this calculation of this tactic of the film making or of the production is that in the world, in the realm of cinema, the best political cause, uh, I mean the most virtuous political cause, it's always soluble in the worst aesthetic or narrative form or in other terms, uh, the opportunist form, you can say, the opportunist form always takes the lead from the virtuous content. At the end, the radical message on the camps, the, on the message about the stigmatization of minorities, the message about the brutality of the state, all this has completely, completely melted. It has been dissolved in the syrup of the stereotype love story. So, now I have to stress that there is something very special about cinema. That is about the making or the manufacturing of movies at this place. Something which makes the difference with other arts, like literature or theatre or, of course, poetry. What is very special is the combination of various devices which all are intended for capturing or arising collective emotions. Combination of pictures, sounds, specifically music, editing effects, etc. And as you will notice, one of the main trumps, let's say, of the film, taken into consideration as a device intended for making the audience cry its eyes out. One of his main devices in this film is the music. A music which has become so famous that it has been recycled many times in other films uh, in various contexts. You will recognize it immediately. The music is, in this film, the core of the moral fraud or the swindle uh, it makes use of. And by fraud or swindle, I mean the sentiment, the sentimental extortion which is constantly at work in it. Or if you prefer the vulgar moralization of a serious, a very serious political matter. Uh, and you will hear what I have in mind here is a uh, uh, particular a track by Andy Edelman which is called Fire on a Booking Theatre, you will recognize it immediately and cry. So, 
with the help of this kind of music. This film is in search of emotional saturation effects. These effects are, among many others, an expression or form of what the German uh, Jewish philosopher Walter Benjamin calls shock, the aesthetic of shock. Uh, Benjamin says that in late modernity condition, the experience of the subject, the experience of the subject in its classical form, this experience is replaced by a series of shocks. You'll find this probably in his uh, Baudelaire book. Uh, from this angle, the crucial difference between experience in that sense and shock is that experience has a dialectic dimension, which means that experience in the classical sense is related to narratives. That is, it is what can be testified about. The shock, by contrast, is not an experience. It is just a breach in which the affects of the subject are saturated. So the shock is something the subject cannot testify about, because this is beyond the human experience, properly speaking, because the imagination of the subject has no grasp, has no hold on it. For this reason, the shock is, Benjamin says, at the heart or at the core of late modern art, futurism, surrealism, Dadaism, etc. So, what cinema has invented is the industrial use of this, the industrial use of the shock effect in the aesthetic dimension. And what is specific for a shock effect in, the, in this reading is that it never runs into, let's say, critic, does not be too critic. It is completely disconnected from an experience of the subject, that is the spectator, in terms of critical statements, critical faults about what the object of the film is, or what the film itself is made of, the kinds of pictures, sound, edit, the material of the film, if you want. The affective or the emotional saturation effect, this effect is comparable to the paralysis of the critical ability of the subject. And this is, I think, this is exactly what is at stake with the musical hit in this film. And it's interesting to think a bit about the let's say the double nature of this film, which is both at the same time very commercial and openly dissident. It's very interesting to think, it's uh, exciting to think about the combination of motives which are politically, politically motives which are beyond any redemption uh, in the, the plot of the film, Jack, the main character, is completely, totally allergic to his patriotic duty, completely allergic to this war, and he manages to escape it. That is, he prefers to spend all these years of war in jail rather than under the uniform of a Marine Corps soldier, which is a very incorrect message, to be sure. Um, so, um, this kind of, uh, let's say, ideological narrative arrangement is between a form which is completely conventional and messages, messages which can be dissident, uh, which can send. This kind of arrangement is very typical for Hollywood. For the way Hollywood 
faces and solves this kind of trouble or embarrassment with the past, it is exactly that, the melodramatic form, but in the soap, the soap in Bulgarian terms, the soap, uh, that is the saturation effect, it is what makes it possible for the general public to swallow, let's say, to swallow the bitter pill of the duty of memory at, as it has after the war uh, to be faced, uh, uh, I mean, this very grim episode of the deportation of the American Japanese after Pearl Harbor. Um, it looks like, I would say to, to finish on this, it looks like a bargain. It's a bargain, a bargain, a dubious intellectual bargain uh, from the filmmakers with the public, but also with the state, with the political authority. And what has to be noticed is that, generally speaking, it works. It works. Because we can see that it's one of the ways some of the most salient aspects of the uncomfortable past can be tamed by a nation or by a community, or by a nation as a community. But we have to notice that there is a very distinct limit to that. Let's say it works more or less in this, on this kind of issue here, this chapter of the war, but uh, uh, if you take, uh, as we saw it uh, last semester, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, it's a completely different matter. Uh, because very obviously a piece of sweet music will not suffice to normalize this kind of event. That is to make uh, out of it just a piece of collective memory among others. That is the, the inert element of a collective memory patrimony. And for this reason, there is not, uh, as far as I know at least, there is no equivalent in Hollywood production uh, to come see the paradise about Hiroshima Nagasaki. The limit or the red line is maybe designed by this film we saw last week, uh, Emperor. Uh, that is uh, a film which you saw in the short clips we saw last week. It's a film which espouses the melodrama form too. Uh, I mean, uh, this mixture uh, of uh, massive destruction uh, of uh, Japanese cities by air bombing and uh, a love story. Uh, but this would be the limit, I'd say, in narrative terms. Uh, that is where the compatibility between love story, which is, as you know, the basic, the very basic cinematographic or filmic narrative uh, in general, or narrative device, that is the etern eternal uh, basic form, boy meets girl. Mm -hmm. So this is the limit of the compatibility of this basic form with war extreme violence, with war crimes, with war brutality. In Emperor, we have already reached, I would say, the limit of the limit in terms of compatibility. I mean, this kind of buffer zone between the acceptable and the intolerable in terms of narrative decency. You maybe noticed that this general fellow uh, looking desperately for his lost Japanese, Japanese love in the ruins of Tokyo. Uh, okay, this is the, the limit of the limit. And this limit becomes visible uh, as the pathetic, the dramatic tone gives way in the film to, let's say, kitsch in aesthetic terms. And in Emperor, this limit is crossed in the passage of the film where General Fellows makes 
Freeman, we, we, I think we did not see this part of the film, but I remind it shortly. This passage in the film where General Fellows makes tremendous efforts so that the city of Fukuoka, where his Japanese lost love is supposed to live, be struck off the list of the uh, sites which have to be bombed. This is purely and simply uh, grotesque. So this is, I imagine, the reason why Hollywood has not attempted to tame uh, Hiroshima Nagasaki's memory by implementing this sort of narrative device. You can imagine this kind of plot. One of the pilots of the bomber uh, who dropped uh, the bombs on Hiroshima Nagasaki remembering empathetically a torrid affair he would have had in the past with one of the victims of the raid. This would have been of very uh, bad taste, let's say, off, off limits. And this is why, in spite of all capacities of Hollywood to make very bad uh, taste films, this limit uh, has not been reached. Okay, this would be all about uh, come see the paradise and maybe now we can finally see some parts of it. I hope you liked this last scene. Um, okay, you got what I meant. So, uh, do you have some, something to say? Comments, remarks, questions, whatever. Could you briefly go over how Charlie passed away, or the, Sorry? the three members in the family that passed away, all passed away at the camp, the father, uh, Charlie? So, and, uh, about, yeah, the family, yes, um, it, it was not easy to make the, the cuts to choose the clips because the plot is a, is a bit um, intricated, a bit complicated. So, to sum up, um, and they are in the camps, so the family is in the camp, they are two brothers. Um, one of the brothers um, um, becomes an American so he, and then he dies in a fight. So that's why we see, we see the picture again. And the other one chooses to go to Japan mm -hmm. and exchange of prisoners or something of that kind. So the family is completely it. And the father dies from desperation or whatever despair because uh, he's suspected by the other uh, inmates, people in the camp, to be an FDR informer. So he's despised and put aside and okay, he has become an outcast in the camp and he just dies. So this is the rather dramatic fate of the family in the camp. So maybe something a bit more funny. Um, okay, I will talk uh, shortly. I will present shortly um, the next film, um, and it's about uh, laughing, laughter as a medicine as a medicine intended, let's say, for making paths, so go down the past, uh, this unpleasant past, uh, which sticks in the throat of a community, of a people, of a nation. Uh, laughing or laughter is uh, actually a very efficient means for lightening or alleviating a memory or a memorial burden. And the example I will take now, uh, I found so I found this in uh, uh, a film we already talked about last semester, which is a comedy, a comedy called The Private Navy of Sergeant O'Farrell, filmed by Frank Tashlin. 1968. Uh, interesting film because it is one of the first comedies on the war in the Pacific. Uh, in this film, the 
comic uh, method, let's say, or the comic device, which is intended for life in uh, the burden of memory, is extremely simple. It just consists in uh, substituting something by something else, substituting substitution gain, say. That is replacing the Japanese soldier as a threatening alien, bloody alien, or threatening other, replacing him with a very familiar, reassuring character, you will see in the film, a boy called Calvin, who is just a cheerful Japanese-American from San Francisco, who happened just by the nearest chance to serve under the uniform of the Imperial Japanese uh, Army. And this way, in this scene, we will see the traumatic figure of the terrible enemy is, properly speaking, dissolved in a burst of laughter, since it's a very comic scene. Comedy, that is the comic vein, is here what makes it possible to move, to move on, to pass from the past to the present, that is to emancipate the present from the traumatic past. And now, if we think a bit about this very simple, basic example, we can become aware of something which is very important in terms of, let's say, uh, cinematic, cinematographic or filmic language. Collective memory, as it is worked out and conveyed by movies as a language of its own, of its own. Um, or maybe movie is a language, is a language, and this is what brings it close to the Freudian unconscious. Collective memory is some kind of collective unconscious. And as such, it has collective memory as the structure of a language. This I borrow from a well-known uh, French uh, psychoanalyst uh, and theoretician of psychoanalysis, Jacques Lacan. But the syntax uh, and the rules of if you prefer the grammar, the grammar of this language of collective memory, as it is conveyed here by movie, is completely different from the grammar of the language we use. I mean, in everyday life, in our conscious life, in ordinary speech acts. The syntax of collective memory, as it unveiled, as is it unveiled in a film narrative like this, we'll see, is extremely close, similar, to the syntax of the grammar of the dream, as Freud presents this in his uh, classical famous book, The Interpretation of Dreams. So the pure and simple substitution of a character, or maybe a name, called it, by another in the above mentioned scene, or if you prefer the inversion of a negative sign into a positive sign. That is, the familiar, very familiar Corbin instead of the uncanny, very uncanny Jack. Now, this is typical for what Lacan says. That is, what matters is not the material of the dream, the ma what the dream is made of, but what matters um, in terms of meaning uh, it's before all the structure. <coughs> and here we will see the way, what matters, is the way the structure of the otherness, the otherness of the Japanese, the Japanese as the other, um, the way uh, the structure of the otherness is exchanging, 
uh, a position with another. That is the way the enemy becomes just a friend. So let's see this short clip uh, from uh, Sergeant O'Farrell, uh, private name. So these soldiers uh, are American soldiers uh, uh, based on an island, a real island in the Pacific, an island where nothing happens, and they are looking for beer cans which have been lost in the sea after the ship uh, which was supposed to they could bring uh, this uh, beer cans has been sunk by a Japanese uh, submarine. So they are looking for the cans and they don't find them. Today, uh, it's, um, it's about letters from Iwo Jima uh, by Clint Eastwood, in which has been shot uh, uh, almost 10 years ago. Maybe. So, um, in, the, in the general presentation, I, I use the term whitewashing of okay, the cinema as a uh, device for whitewashing the collective memory. But um, maybe we could use uh, as well to talk about critical debriefing or maybe uh, cinematic therapy. And um, okay, this is what I would like to present about this uh, film by uh, Clint Eastwood. Uh, the main lesson. Uh, if I may say so, main lesson of the film uh, being some sort of um, in the style of the, the narrative after all that is um, taking everything into consideration after all these years and so on and so forth um, so after all says the film these people these Japanese soldiers we had to confront uh, very bitterly in a total war and this 60 years ago already. So taking everything into consideration, these people were not depraved animals. Actually, they were just like us people who were strongly attached to their country, to their family, people who just like us had mixed feeling, very mixed feeling about this war, who often were put in the cranberry uh, as they had to face challenges, all kinds of challenges in terms of conflicts between private and public feelings, uh, commitments and this all. Just like us, uh, they were torn between all kinds of conflicting emotions, feelings, etc. The film, you will see, the film focuses on the character of the Japanese general who was in charge, uh, commanding uh, during this very bitterly fought battle on the island of Iwo Jima. This man uh, is a very sensitive, good, well-educated, clever man. And as in many other debriefing or let's say re-education films on this war, the special mark which is meant, which is intended for designing this human distinction of, of this character is the fact that he is very familiar with the United States. He has been living there, he has been trained, educated there for a long time. He speaks a distinguished American English with, of course, the um, slight Japanese accent which is needed. Um, for the film. So, 
unlike the ordinary officers or non-commissioned officers he has under his orders, is not at all just a will for the military machine. He does his best uh, all along this battle. He does his best to spare his men. He knows pretty well that the battle is lost. He fights for the honor and this to the bitter end, but in a very humane way. He's not a fanatic. He doesn't despise or hate his enemy or his familiar enough with him, with the enemy, to be able to see things from the enemy's angle. <laughs> all the letters he sends to his wife during the battle, all the film is built up uh, about, uh, around letters. But as well, letters which are written and not sent uh, by Japanese rank and file soldiers are in the narration, in the film, they are a testimony for the humanity of these men, of these soldiers from very various origin and social conditions. For most of them, they are not brainwashed fanatics, but just ordinary people under the uniform who love their parents, love their wives and children, who just want to live or would have liked to live, to go on living, and we still, in spite of this, uh, will uh, are going to be their doom in the battle. They will die. So, in this film, a new version of this dramatic chapter of the war in the Pacific is set. This is what is to uh, tell us as some kind of a lesson of, about all this. Everything having been taken into consideration, the Japanese are not, were not at that time a damn species, <coughs> but they were actually our fellow men having in this context their own reasons which were conflicting, openly conflicting with ours. So what was um, definitely bad on their side, blameworthy, it's not the men, it's not the soldiers, it's not even the general in the situation, it is the Japanese military regime which made fanatics out of these very sensible persons. But you will notice that this, let's say this narrative move, this narrative displacement, this new version, let's say, of this history, which is, let's notice it by passing, which is a very powerful version because Kate is good of course, is a very important uh, character, person in Hollywood's landscape. So this new version, um, the displacement, this version displays, is of course very important, uh, it's crucial, but on, from another angle, it's modest. For, on one hand, um, on the occasion of this displacement, um, the restoration process of the human status of the former total enemy is completed. It is completed within the American community, but on the other hand, this film constantly criticizes the excesses of militarism. It never criticizes the army as such, as an authoritarian institution. So, from this angle, 
Gottfried Eastwood remains true to his well-known cult of military grandeur, of the spirit of self-sacrifice, of total devotion to the institution, the army, with all, all what God with this unconditional obedience, loyalty, etc., etc. So the film leaves completely intact, intangible, the political myth of the clean war led by honorable men and an honorable institution, uh, the army. So let's see. That. presenting an American body 
as a cocaine body, as a rule, white man's body. At the time the war was raging in Southeastern Asia, this appears to be an untangable rule. I will show you a sequence from Nobi, that is Fires on the Plane, the film by Kong Ichigawa. We saw another film by Kong Ichigawa uh, last semester, The Burmese Heart. Uh, and in this sequence, the US Army appears to be um, some sort of a mechanic apparatus only, made of tanks, machine guns, trucks, rather than a troop. Uh, properly speaking, made of soldiers, made of uh, human, uh, human flesh, uh, human beings in uniform. In this sequence, American soldiers are filmed from very far away and appear as very distant and very distant impersonal silhouettes. They hardly utter a word, they are anonymous, they are deprived of any subjective dimension. They are just, in Novi, the overwhelming force that has smashed the routine and hungry imperial army. It takes place in the Philippines, the sequence of this, the film itself. So, what can uh, this quasi absence, uh, this void in place of the enemy, what can we ascribe it? Of course, certainly, partly to technical reasons. That is, difficulty at that time for Japanese filmmakers to hire American or European type English-speaking actors. Okay, but I do not think this explanation was, would exhaust the subject. Uh, it's not a sufficient answer. We have to think more about it. For what is more disturbing is this. It seems that the victim uh, keeps the advantage he has taken over the defeated part in terms of capacity to depict him, to stage him, to reenact re his deeds and thoughts in a narrative, at least in a cinematic uh, narrative. Compare really to who's uh, to those which stage the most detestable aspects of the American occupation. Um, but oh, this is a Japanese, this occupation is a Japanese matter too. Because many Japanese people were protagonists of this occupation. Of course. The Japanese war film, films seem to be very, let's say, shy, embarrassed when they have to make American or regional Western bodies appear in the context of the armed confrontation from the harbor to the capitulation of Japan. And the interesting and rather puzzling thing is that this inhibition seems to vanish immediately as soon as the war tips over into peace and occupation. You will see a short scene from Children of Nagasaki, um, which is on this issue rather eloquent which is distinctly satirical and pointing an accusing finger at the occupation process. Surprisingly enough, this kind of restraint or this kind of embarrassment of Japanese film in the exhibition of the former, the former arch, arch foes, body, uh, this can still be uh, taken notice of <coughs> in recent films which have very different tones. I mean, from one to another. In many of these films, the American as the enemy becomes completely impersonal, anonymous. He has no human shape or no human form. Since war is seen in these films through the eyes of the, pop of the Japanese population, which suffers from the destructive air bombings of Japan cities. So, the, Japan, the, the enemy only consists in uh, small black dots in the sky which drop from where uh, bombs uh, rain over the city and spread terror over the, the, the top. And this always from a very huge distance. You will see how this neutralization, almost disappearance effect 
of the enemy in his human dimension, uh, how this works in this animation film, which is already a classical film, uh, The Grave of the Fireflies. And this, of course, uh, what is at stake here, is uh, one of uh, the most salient traits of air war, that if the enemy disappears as body or bodies, and war violence becomes abstract, an abstraction, at the same time as the brutalization of war makes a gigantic step forward. No cocktail bombing, um, February, March um, uh, 45 is more than 100,000 dead. So, and we will see at the end, even that uh, even a very, very nationalist film like uh, Yamato, it's a, uh, I mean, it's a, a film which is so nationalist that it's only intended for the Japanese public and that I couldn't find it with subtitles, any kind of subtitle in any foreign language. Um, so, if, so in Yamato, you will see, um, uh, the film depicts the last mission, which is a suicide mission, of the career Yamato, uh, which was the pride at that time, the pride of the Japanese Navy. So this is the final battle on whose occasion the ship has been sunk uh, by um, American uh, uh, bombs, uh, planes, uh, ships, uh, and so on. So, so this battle is reconstructed. It's a big show. It's reconstructed, but in the total absence of any reverse angle shot. It's a long sequence, about only it lasts more than 20 minutes, so we will not have time to look at it entirely. But at no moment in the sequence, the enemy <coughs> appears in person. I mean, the only thing from the enemy you see are uh, planes and bombs. And by contrast, you can remember how um, in uh, Midway, uh, we saw last week, the battle is, was constantly depicted, the battle at sea was constantly depicted from both angles, American and Japanese, and in other American films, uh, the standard uh, being Torah, Torah, Torah. Uh, this, uh, this goes exactly the same way. So that in Torah, 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 it goes so far in this direction that all the Japanese part of the film is shot by Japanese film makers. It's a film, it's, it's a Japanese, some kind of a Japanese film inside the, the film. So in Yamato, there is something uh, which I would call a autarchic or even autistic, so about the way uh, it's only uh, film from the uh, Japanese and Of course, one could object that, okay, there's some very obvious political reason for this, because this kind of nationalist film aims at extolling the Yamato school sacrifice and not, of course, to revive the hostility toward the Americans who have become allies, protectors, and friends of Japan. But it seems to me that there might some, be some other reasons, some more um, buried reasons, uh, buried in the, the authors or maybe in the public subconscious, but OK, this is something we can only have um, hypothesis about. And finally, the film. Well, this kind of inhibition seems to be lifted partly or completely are what we can maybe call transnational films or post-national films or joint venture films. A very, very exemplary um, one among them being um, 
Nagisha, Nagishi Oshima's film, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. Of course, uh, Oshima is a very talented filmmaker, but he succeeds in this film in directing uh, the absolute Western star, that is David Bowie, exactly the same way, uh, with a very sure hand, uh, the same way he directs the Japanese star, uh, Takeshi Tani. And of course, such a film, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, is an international uh, production, uh, as are more other films recently shot by Japanese filmmakers, in which uh, good um, Western actors uh, appear, which is something, as I said, which is rather new. So, and this move or this displacement, of course, is a distinct effect of globalization uh, in the dimension of the industry. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, move uh, to uh, the first big pigs and battleships. Okay, so th this kind of, of scene you can find it uh, in many post-war Japanese films. It's, it's not a problem. It's, uh, satirical view on the occupation, uh, this is okay. But showing uh, the enemy uh, in the context, in the context of a battle, of the war itself, it seems to be much more difficult. So we show, we will see a very uh, short a uh, clip from Children of Nakazaki. The, um, it's um, it's worth and bad. The, the I mean the, the quality of the picture. Um, but with um, I don't know why Brazilian subtitles. <laughs> the, the, the only available uh, version we have. And um, okay, anyway, for for the. If we have to see it doesn't matter much, we will understand uh, what it's about, it's very simple. So you see the enemy completely disappears, only planes and bombs, but uh, no human uh, presence of the enemy. And to finish with uh, Yamato, yeah? Yes, there uh, are a few uh, minutes on Yamato, so the, the battle um, from the Japanese kind of. It's a big show, it takes 20 minutes, so we we'll see only the beginning. Okay, so it uh, continues endless like this. There was more blood, more hero. I imagine even if you don't understand Japanese, you can feel the sounds to the nationalist uh, patriotic tone or, or tune of, of the film. Okay, this could be all for today.